At Fermilab, we study nature at its most fundamental, drilling down to the smallest scales of matter using some of the largest and most advanced machines in the world. Accelerators, powerful microscopes, send particles barreling at near light speed into other matter, creating subatomic scraps. Detectors zoom in on those fleeting pieces, making the invisible perceptible. And sophisticated computers sweep through all of it, crushing mountains of information into gems of data. We also use our cutting edge technology to explore the mysteries of dark matter and the quantum realm. Thousands of scientists from around the world partner with Fermilab to explore how the universe works, expanding humanity's understanding of matter, energy, space, and time. Fermilab is solving the mysteries of the universe. Welcome to Fermilab's Family Open House 2022 and the classroom presentation on exploring temperature and energy. Lou Melton is an education facilitator and a retired physicist. He will be explaining the basics. Elvin Harms is an engineering physicist in our accelerator division, and he will explain how this relates to design and implementation in experiments here at Fermilab. Take it away, Lou. Welcome to Exploring Temperature and Energy. Heat energy is the energy of motion of the molecules of a substance. The more heat applied to a substance, the faster all the molecules move. Temperature is a measure of how fast the molecules of a substance are moving on the average. There are three temperature scales for measuring temperature, Kelvin, Celsius, and Fahrenheit. There are conversion methods between the different temperature scales. There are three different phases of water. For liquid water, the molecules are close together and collide frequently. As liquid water cools from four degrees Celsius to zero degrees Celsius, it freezes into solid ice, expands, and becomes less dense. The molecules are packed together in a rigid structure. As ice heats up, the reverse occurs. When liquid water is heated to 100 degrees Celsius, it boils and changes to a gas, in other words, steam. The steam molecules are further apart and do not collide as often as liquid water molecules. I'm now going to perform a demonstrations of the freezing and boiling of water. First, I have a, a small plastic container on which I've drawn a horizontal line. I've uh, filled the container with water up to the line. It will now place it in the freezer for a while, and we will see the results a little later. Now I've taken the container of water out of the freezer, and we see that there is a layer of ice above the line that's floating on the water. So the ice is less dense and is expanded in volume above the line. I am now going to demonstrate the boiling of water. I have filled a tea kettle with some water and we'll heat it up to the boiling point and we'll see what happens. And I believe it's starting to boil now. And we hear the teapot sizzling and steaming. As it whistles. Can see some of the steam going out of the top. So the water absorbed enough heat energy to reach the boiling point and transform the liquid water into a gas, which we call steam. 
Here we see the effect of temperature on a gas and on a liquid. In winter, as the air temperature within a car tire decreases, the pressure or force of the air on the walls of the tire decreases and the tire goes flat. One must therefore add air to the tire to raise the pressure. In winter, as the temperature decreases in water pipes in a house, they may freeze if they are near an outside wall. Then the pressure increases from the expanding ice in the pipes and the pipes will eventually burst. Note that not all liquids behave this way. Here we see the effect of temperature on the volume of a gas. As the temperature of the air in balloons decreases, the volume of the balloons decreases and the balloons contract and get smaller. If the temperature is then increased, the balloons expand and get bigger. I am now going to demonstrate the effect on temperature on the volume of a gas. Uh, in this example, the air within a balloon. So I've blown up a balloon and I've made a mark on it so that I will measure along that mark, measure the size or circumference of the balloon. And I've measured it at 21 inches in circumference. Now I will put the balloon in the refrigerator, reduce the temperature, and then we'll measure it again and see what happens. Now I'm going to take the balloon out of the refrigerator after it's cooled down, and I'll measure the circumference again to see what's happened to it. And here we see now that the balloon has shrunk in circumference to 20 and one half inches. So it decreased in volume with a decrease in temperature. Now I'm going to let it warm up a bit, um, just holding it in my hands and see what happens to the volume then. Now, after warming up the balloon, we're measuring it again, and we see that the circumference this time is back to 21 inches. So after increasing the temperature, we have increased the volume back up to its original size. Conduction heating is illustrated below. Block A has a higher temperature and faster moving molecules than block B, which has a lower temperature and slower moving molecules. As the two blocks are put in contact with one another, the faster block A molecules bump into the slower block B molecules, which gain energy, move faster, and increase in temperature as heat energy flows between the blocks. The molecules of block A lose energy, slow down, and decrease in temperature. Eventually, all the molecules of block A and block B move at the same average velocity and achieve the same temperature. Then the heat energy stops flowing. Convection heating in liquids and gases is shown below. Here we have the molecules at the bottom being heated, becoming less dense and rising to the top, while the cooler molecules at the top are denser and sink to the bottom, becoming heated, rising to the top, and the cycle is repeated until all the molecules are uniformly 
heated. I am now going to demonstrate convection heating. I have filled a flask with water, and I am now going to add a small amount of a special purple crystal. It sinks to the bottom of the flask and dissolves. And then I'm going to heat it with a small flame. And soon we see the warmer purple water from the bottom flow up to the top by convection and heat the rest of the fluid as it circulates throughout the water. So that illustrates convection heating. Heating and cooling are important processes at Fermilab. Electromagnets are used in particle accelerators. They surround particle beams and steer and focus them. Conventional electromagnets heat up when current flows in the magnetic coils. They must be cooled with water to prevent overheating. Superconducting electromagnets do not heat up when current flows in the magnetic coils, since they are made of superconducting materials, which have no electrical resistance and hence do not heat up. They are cooled to near absolute zero using liquid helium, about two Kelvin to four Kelvin, so that they become superconducting. Electromagnets are used at Fermilab when accelerating elementary charged particles. Below, we see an example of a beam tunnel at Fermilab. The upper assembly shows conventional electromagnets, and the lower assembly shows superconducting electromagnets, which are used when accelerating elementary charged particles to even higher velocities and energies. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation, Lou. That was that was wonderful. We are going to turn to uh, Dr. Elvin Harms, but uh, before we do, I would also like to mention that uh, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in chat and we will get to them. Thank you very much. Take it away, Elvin. Thanks, Lori. I'm gonna try and share my screen here. Uh, how do I look or do I need to swap displays? That's good. It is. OK, so uh, thank you, everybody. Hello. Welcome from Fermilab. I'm in my office today and appreciate the great presentation that Lou made uh, today. I'm going to expand a little bit on what he talked about and, and tell you some more about how we use these concepts of temperature and energy uh, here at Fermilab every day. Uh, as Lou mentioned, we use superconductivity uh, on electromagnets, and I'm sharing the same photograph here. And to give a little more information, that upper main ring uh, was was uh, composed of electromagnets and achieved peak particle beam energies of 500 GeV. That's 500 giga or billion electron volts. And at the at the day uh, in its time, uh, this was the most powerful, uh, highest energy particle accelerator in the world. Uh, some years later, we built that lower ring called the Tevatron, uh, which was composed of superconducting magnets. Uh, down here, and we achieved a peak energy almost double of the of the main ring, 950 uh, billion electron volts. We called it the Tevatron because it was nearly a trillion electron volts. What's interesting to note, this is a four mile circumference tunnel. And if you notice the magnets in both rings, upper and lower, are about the same length. They're following the same path. And yet 
uh, we were able to double the beam energy in the Tevatron. And the difference is that with superconductivity, we were able to double the magnetic field in these magnets in the lower ring uh, when cooled with liquid helium as opposed to the water-cooled electromagnet, electromagnets at the top. Now we can apply that principle of superconductivity not just to magnets, but in other parts of particle accelerators as well. Uh, for example, here at, other, uh, here at Fermilab and other uh, laboratories around the world, we're making the devices that give the particles their energy. The magnets do not do that. Uh, these other devices, uh, we are also making superconducting. Here you see what we call a uh, SRF cavity, uh, a, a radio frequency cavity uh, under production. And devices like this, when we similarly cool them to 2 Kelvin or 450 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, we can achieve incredibly high voltages, uh, voltages as high as 35 million volts per a one meter length. So when we uh, cool this device, for example, uh, down to liquid helium and put um, a power source to it, we can generate those amounts of energies. Um, we are building a new particle accelerator here called PIP2 or Proton Improvement Plan 2. It's going to replace our nearly 50 year old uh, accelerator. And we're going to exploit this technology uh, of superconducting RF in that new PIP2 project. This is something I'm involved with right now. Before I go on though, I'm showing you, I have just a sample of uh, a piece of one of those cavities that I have in the photograph. We use a very high purity niobium. It's a, it's a rather rare metal, but uh, you know we have it. We use uh, this niobium uh, to, to, uh, to make these superconducting cavities. Now a little bit about PIP2. It will be a superconducting, what we call continuous wave linear accelerator. It will, uh, its output energy will be double of our existing linear accelerator, uh, up to 800 million electron volts. And it has five different styles of what we call cryomodules. Those cavities I showed in the previous slide in different sizes and shapes are within these five different cryomodules. Uh, you see that this is uh, going to be the highest power, highest energy proton LINAC and uh, in the world. And it will be the first accelerator built here in the United States with a lot of major international contributions. You see these five different kinds of cryomodules and flags above them depicting the different countries that are participating with us or providing materials for those cryomodules. You see, in addition to the United States, we have uh, partners from uh, Poland, from India, from the United Kingdom, uh, from France, as well as Italy, and we're all working together to build this technically complex state-of-the-art particle accelerator between now and the end of, uh, end of this decade. Uh, what I show here just very briefly is who those partners are and the expertise they're bringing to, uh, to bear with us. Um, they're excited to be part of this project. They have some technologies that they want to advance, and this is a good way to do it. And we can also take advantage of their skills and improve our own skills as we all work together to build this uh, exciting new particle accelerator here and really propel Fermilab's physics program for many decades into the future. Here you see a depiction of where the PIP2 linear accelerator will sit with respect to uh, the Fermilab campus. Maybe someday you can visit us, but our iconic Wilson Hall high rise is shown here and our existing accelerator complex begins in this old LINAC, which currently operates, feeds a booster, and then the main injector. And from the main injector, particles are propelled or produced and propelled for our physics program. In the future, this PIP2 linear accelerator will be built. We're st we've started construction of this, uh, of this first building already. It will feed the booster at a higher energy and then the entire complex, again, uh, by the end of this decade. You see the different shapes of the cavities I'm talking about, and these different shapes um, are due to the fact that the particles, uh, as they're accelerated through the PIP2 LINAC, are running at different velocities from nearly rest to nearly but not quite the speed of light. And to take advantage uh, to most efficiently accelerate those particles, we need these different shapes to do the best job we can to accelerate uh, those particles. You see, for example, here is uh, one of the intermediate ones called a single spoke uh, resonator. We installed this in a test stand uh, in 2019 and 2020 through 21 and used this to accelerate a particle beam. It, it proved that the technology worked. Uh, this included a cavity built by one of our partners in India. 
we cooled this down. We ran a particle beam through it successfully and demonstrated that we are able to master the technology. And now we can continue with production of further devices like this one. Uh, my work here at PIP2 is to lead a part of the team that takes some of those parts and many more from both here in the United States and these other countries and connect them together into a state of the part, uh, state of the art particle accelerator. When we had our groundbreaking ceremony a couple of years ago, we gathered for a photograph and you see some of the Fermi lab as well as some of our international partners gathered here. So it's a very large group of people working together uh, to build this accelerator. My job is really to be one of the jigsaw puzzle uh, uh, workers. So I am putting a specific part of our PIP2 puzzle together. I'm a team leader directing which pieces go where, how they fit together. And we hope that in the coming years, we will have successfully completed this really complex, really beautiful uh, jigsaw puzzle that we call PIP2. And with, you, you, I, with that, I thank you for your attention. And um, I think Lou and I and everybody else are anxious to uh, answer your questions and uh, uh, help you learn more about temperature, energy, and what we do here at Fermilab. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elvin. And we do have a few questions that have come in. So I'm gonna go right to them. Um, the first one was, what are we hoping to find different at the, the higher energies? And are we talking about gravitons or something? Who, who would you like to tackle that? Uh, go ahead, Elvin. <laughs> okay. Uh, Primarily, the, with these higher energies, uh, we will be able to produce a very intensive beam of particles called neutrinos. Uh, neutrinos are everywhere. In fact, 10 trillion of them from the sun just pass through all of us. <clears throat> um, we know they exist, but we don't understand all of their properties. So by virtue of building this PIP2 machine, we will be able to create a very intense uh, beam of neutrinos point them to some massive detectors which are uh, going to be built underground in western South Dakota uh, uh, in a, in a uh, previous gold mine, uh, a mile and a half underground, and in a controlled way try to understand the behavior of neutrinos. Uh, we know there are lots of them, uh, but why do they behave the way they do, especially the fact that we know there are at least three types and they can spontaneously change from one type to another. And we really hope to understand the behavior of neutrinos and how they fit into the whole scheme of the universe. Thank you. And we have another question. How much is the energy difference in GEV between Fermilab and CERN's particle accelerator? Also, how will PIP2 help in reducing that difference? Okay, first off, the difference in energy, the Tevatron's peak energy um, of a single beam was uh, about one trillion electron volts, one TeV. And uh, the LHC, when it operates at its peak energy is seven TeV or seven trillion electron volts per beam. So about seven times, uh, uh, seven times uh, higher energy. And that's a lot. Uh, PIP2 is not going to help that difference. PIP2 is replacing sort of the low energy part of our uh, linear accelerator. Uh, our, yeah, the low energy part um, by doubling its energy. Our goal is really to have a brighter beam so that we can make um, so that we can make uh, this more intense beam of neutrinos. CERN really focuses their their physics program really focuses on uh, the highest energies achievable, um, and, and we recognize their role in that. In fact, we're contributing some components to help them achieve higher and higher energies. Our role is to focus on the neutrino physics and CERN likewise is contributing to our physics program for providing some detectors. So we're not really trying to bridge this energy gap. CERN is worrying about the energy, uh, worrying about the energy frontier and we're, we're, we're focused on neutrino physics, which uh, doesn't require necessarily the highest energies achievable. So I hope that helps. Okay, is there anything better than pulse lasers to reach zero Kelvin? Either one of you can answer. Or do we have an answer for that? <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, you know, our, our focus is really not on the lowest temperatures, but uh, the, the operating temperatures, the coolant we need to operate our particle accelerator. 
And in fact, we, we don't need to go any lower than 1.8 Kelvin, actually. To get any lower it is really a challenge. And with the size of our components, we need, uh, we need liquid helium as the, uh, as the uh, cooling medium. So uh, we're not really in the business of, of looking at alternate low temperature uh, media. Okay. And I don't know anything you... on your side. Oh, sorry. No, that's good, Elvin. Thanks. Okay. And how did you select the five different accelerating structures of PIP2? And how did you determine exactly where the um, boundary interface should be between the components in terms of the contribution of energy of each one? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, first off, we've been working on the design for PIP2 for about 10 years. And it's going to be about another 10 years before it's completely done. So a lot of smart people, smarter than me, have been worrying about this for a long time. And it's basically a lot of computer modeling. It's looking at previous experience at other accelerators and, and, and doing, you know, this doing this modeling of saying, okay, we have certain technologies, they seem to work best at these velocities. Uh, and at some point you just make a decision where the boundaries are, you just say, okay, it looks like we're rolling off in our efficiency here. This other technology is rolling up. Let's find that that compromise, that happy point, uh, and just make the decision that you know there. So, uh, computer modeling and, and and some common sense and reaching consensus by a large number of people saying, "Yep, this is what makes sense." So, I hope that helps. Um, how did you become a scientist um, in the first place? And um, Lou, I'd like you to answer this one as well. So why, Lou, why don't you start and then we'll get to Elvin. Okay. Um, I got interested in physics uh, actually when I was in high school and then later decided to uh, specialize in physics. Uh, I had a physics major, uh, got my bachelor's and master's degree in physics and also uh, studied math, which is a, a important component of physics. And uh, my early career was in uh, nuclear physics. And I was always interested in that. And uh, uh, later on in midlife, I changed to some other uh, areas of science and engineering, but now have come back to my original physics uh, experience uh, and enjoy being uh, an education facilitator at Fermilab. Thank you, Lou. And Elvin, you want to tell us how you became a scientist? Sure. I think I became interested in science, not necessarily a scientist, but interest in science when I was probably three or four years old. Here's my first experiment. Uh, can anybody imagine what my experiment was? This is a rock. And in my other hand, I had a hand, I had a hammer. And I was curious what's inside of the rock. And, uh, you know, I broke it open. I was probably getting a little bit older. And uh, my parents gave me a magnifying glass and I could see even further in. Um, but then you move to microscopes. And uh, really what we do at, at Fermilab, we have a giant microscope, much more powerful than, than uh, my one as a four-year-old, but uh, same concept. So I've been interested in science you know, for a long, long time. When I was in grade school, um, <clears throat> I was fascinated how in some of the books I read, scientists said that they could uh, take a piece of uranium the size of a lemon and power New York City for a significant amount of time. And I thought that was really neat, but of course could not understand that. But in high school and then in college, uh, like Lou, I pursued, pursued uh, nuclear physics and particularly nuclear reactor technology, thinking that might be my career path. And then uh, some, some uh, larger events got in the way, and I uh, instead got a job here at Fermilab operating the particle accelerators. And, uh, you know, can, my, my knowledge of their various branches of physics has grown over the years, um, but I still have this basic fundamental interest in, in uh, science and what we do it here at Fermilab. And there's a follow-up question um, for both of you. So what's the favorite part of your job? And someone in particular for Elvin wants to know what your favorite part about PIP2 is. So um, Elvin, why don't we start with you and then we'll go to uh, Luke. Yeah, uh, my favorite part of the job 
uh, well, I'm not wearing a lab coat. In the summertime, I wear shorts to work and I can ride my bike to work. So that's that's one thing I really like. It's a relaxed and yet very busy atmosphere. So uh, there's a lot of pressure to uh, meet schedules, et cetera, but it's also very relaxed and, and uh, very collaborative. The people are really the key to what we do. And that really, uh, I think, keys into my favorite part about PIP2 is the fact that we are working with uh, uh, partners from all over the world. And every week I have some video conferences with uh, collaborators in India, in Germany, uh, Poland, for example. I've had meetings already this week. Uh, yeah, with all of those countries and others. So I really like uh, that aspect of working uh, on PIP2 is the people, but also something that's the fact that we are building something brand new. And uh, probably the last new accelerator I'll be involved with in my career. But to see it, um, I can look. I can go outside and look and see the buildings coming up, see the designs coming together. That that's really neat. That's my favorite part. And Lou, what's your favorite part? Well, I really enjoy uh, leading tours at Fermi Lab, uh, which I did before uh, COVID and its restrictions. Hopefully, we'll open up to the public again in the near future. Uh, it, it, I really enjoy uh, explaining what goes on at Fermi Lab, the various uh, parts of the lab, and the physics that uh, we do there. I, I appreciate uh, the interest that uh, both students and non-students uh, have in what we're doing. Okay. Um... And Lou, I think this one's for you. Do we know of places in the universe where similar conditions are present naturally to what we do here at Fermilab when we're doing our experiments? Well, I'm sure there may be other planets uh, out there that uh, uh, we're gradually finding out about that have uh, extreme con uh, conditions of cold and heat. Uh, but uh, certainly in outer space, uh, uh, we know that the temperature uh, is very close to absolute zero. It might be, you know, one or two degrees Kelvin uh, that exists throughout the universe. And uh, the radiation that exists from the original uh, beginning of the universe, the so-called Big Bang. So uh, those temperatures are out there and we're able to reproduce them uh, using liquid helium for uh, our various experiments. Elvin, is there anything you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, I'll just add that we probably all heard of cosmic rays. So there are uh, particles coming, raining from the sun, uh, from other stars, wherever, all the time. And uh, those cosmic rays are useful for us in that we can use them to calibrate our detectors. Uh, the problem with cosmic rays, and they reach very high energies, are that they're sort of an uncontrolled, uncontrolled source of particles. So they're useful for us, but we really need to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, create more controlled conditions than you would normally find in the universe uh, for our experiments. So we, we try and refine a little bit uh, the conditions that we find in the universe. Okay, thank you. How's the interior of the accelerator like PIP2 um, maintained? Are the cavities cleaned periodically? Good question. So um, the the uh, the accelerator itself is in a tunnel that you can walk through, but it's closed off when we're running the particle beam or running the voltage in the cavities. But inside of the actual cavities, uh, we we maintain a very very high vacuum. Uh, it, the vacuum level is is better than the conditions in outer space. Actually, uh, we use uh, high tech pumps to get all of the air and all the molecules out. And there's two reasons for that. First off, if the particle beam were to hit one of those gas molecules, they would they would scatter and we would lose the beam, which sort of degrades our physics. The other thing is if we have dust particles inside of these particle inside of these cavities operating at uh, the voltages of millions of volts per meter length, you could create an arc and destroy the cavity. So in fact, once these cavities are assembled in clean rooms, and then when they're put together, this is all done in a clean room environment, and we strive to never open up that volume again. We maintain a very high vacuum and um, take great pains to ensure that these are never opened up again. 
So the, we hope we never have to do the cleaning, yeah. but if we do, it's a very, it's a very complicated, uh, long process. Uh, if we had to replace one of these cavities, it would probably take us a month to warm up uh, the system, take it out, replace uh, the failed component, uh, and put it all back together again. What are the practical applications leading to, uh, or for which one might uh, be from, from the experiments and investigation you presented today? What are a fifth grade uh, oh, we are a fifth grade classroom. So this is a fifth grade classroom asking what the practical applications of our experiments are. Um, Lou, do you want to start? And then we'll go to, um, I mean, sorry, Elvin, do you want to start? And then we'll go to um, Lou. Yeah, I can uh, do a few things. Uh, practical applications, we already have some. <laughs> that uh, are, are, you know, that we can explain that have occurred here at Fermilab. Has anybody ever heard of the internet? Oh, oh, we're using that today. Where did the internet come from? Well, the internet was actually formed um, by our, our partner laboratory in Europe called CERN. Uh, somebody said, you know what, we need a way to share physics data across different computer platforms, be it Macintoshes or Windows machines or Linux. We need some way so that anybody hooked up with any computer can see all the data the same. And that was the birth of world, the World Wide Web and the internet. So physics, and we were, I think, the fourth website in the world. Uh, CERN was the first, another laboratory in California. So the World Wide Web, the internet, I would say is a practical application. And uh, you can thank um, the particle physics, particle physics world for that. Um, a lot of the electronics technologies, high density uh, computer storage, very fast processor chips uh, came from us. Superconducting magnets, the, uh, when the Tevatron was built, there was no market for superconducting wire until we said we need thousands of miles of wire. If any of you have ever gone through or had an MRI done, the basic uh, component of an MRI machine is a superconducting magnet. And the the uh, the the MRI uh, the MRI industry will tell you that Fermilab is what got MRI to happen much faster than it would than it would have normally. So uh, we can take some we we take a lot of credit for that. Um, other practical applications, I think those are yet to be seen. We're doing some work here. In fact, downstairs from me, there's a group that's worrying about uh, a new uh, internet called the quantum internet. Uh, which could be uh, potentially hack proof. So we're looking at some stuff, but our main product isn't really practical applications. Our main product is knowledge. If we stop being curious about the world around us, uh, what's the point? So our, our main, again, our main product is knowledge and, and solving our curiosity. Lou, is there anything you want to add to um, what Elvin said? Um, yeah, there's uh, many applications which were developed some at Fermilab uh, in the past, uh, such as uh, neutron and proton therapy uh, for cancer treatments. Uh, also, uh, PET, PET scans, where uh, you accelerate positrons, which are positively charged particles similar to electrons, uh, and uh, used in positron uh, uh, emission tomography, for instance, scanning the brain and seeing what goes on in there. So there are many medical applications that were developed uh, at Fermilab and other accelerator labs. Uh, a, a practical example, for instance, uh, is uh, what they call vulcanization of tires. So the rubber in tires has to be made stronger uh, and, and more flexible, and uh, they accelerate electrons to do that vulcanization of tires. So there's some very practical uh, everyday applications of of uh, accelerators and the particles that they accelerate. Lou, you reminded me of one more practical application, highly absorbent disposable diapers. <laughs> Probably a little known fact that, that disposable diapers, huggies, whatever, are treated with a particle accelerator beam and they make, uh, they make them more absorbent. Okay, there's another question here. How did you find the machine's parts um, or are they all custom made? Where do the parts come from? 
That's a good question. And um, at least my experience, we do both. We try and find off the shelf components to the greatest extent practical. And you can imagine for electronics, uh, uh, for some vacuum pumps, for example, uh, more or less the common components that we need in an accelerator, we try and buy uh, what exists. Oftentimes we need custom machined parts. Magnets are one of a kind, there's a cryo modules. And so we have to work with, uh, we have to work with vendors who are uh, suited in high tech skills, or uh, we have to work with vendors and have them develop the, the capabilities, the tooling, uh, the expertise to, to build what we need. So it's really a hybrid between both, both uh, you know, off the shelf and, and custom build. We have our own machine shop here who can do some work for us, but we also have, uh, for example, machine shops uh, in the area and all over the world that work with us as well for some of our uh, specialized equipment. And just one, we only have time for one more question. Any piece of advice that you can give to students who want to venture into the world of um, accelerator physics and engineering? You want me to go first or Lou, you wanna go first? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll just say briefly, uh, certainly uh, your studies in school, uh, uh, as you get into high school, for instance, when you start studying science, including physics, chemistry, et cetera, and also mathematics. That's very important uh, to becoming a physicist and doing some of the things we do at Fermilab. Go ahead. I, I, I would add, don't just focus on the sciences. Um, try and become a well-rounded individual. Everything in my mind sort of works together. So you need to be able to communicate with people. You need to have knowledge of the world around you. So science, physics, and math, are of course very important, but really a well-rounded ed education, I think gives you uh, the best perspective as a scientist. Always stay curious, um, ask a lot of questions. That's something I do in my job every day is to continue to ask questions. I, I will not admit that I know everybody and rely on the people around you, everybody, friends, parents, teachers, everybody, rely on them for uh, additional information. Yeah, I, I might add too, uh, write, uh, communication skills in general are very important. Uh, writing, uh, you know, we do a lot of writing as physicists and writing up our theories and experiments and communication, you know, uh, doing presentations like we're doing today, where you have to uh, describe things to the public. Uh, so these are very important uh, uh, parts of your education. Well said. Okay. Um, I think that's about all that we have time for. Uh, for our listening audience here, if you would like more information about anything you have heard, check out the Fermilab website. That's at fnal.gov. Uh, it's loaded with information about our scientific research, our arts and lecture series, and all our educational opportunities. While we are not currently open to the public, we have many virtual events and resources that can be accessed through our website. We also have a presence on many social plat media platforms like Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. So um, we've got a lot of different opportunities that are open to the public and hopefully we will eventually be able to welcome you on site as well. So thank you all for your participation today. Thank you, everyone.